Hi, everyone. If you are uh, planning on joining us for today's event from the IMT in Madison on art and class struggle, just a quick note to let you know that we'll be getting started in five minutes. So hang in there and we'll be seeing you soon. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our first event of 2021, uh, hosted by the Madison branch of the International Marxist Tendency. I'm so glad uh, that you've chosen to join us, spend your Sunday late afternoon uh, online to discuss such an important and relevant topic. My name is Yvonne. I'm a member of the Madison branch of the International Marxist Tendency. Like I said, we're so glad that you could join us today. A few housekeeping things before we get started. We are streaming live on Facebook and YouTube. If you have any technical issues, maybe try one or, or, the, other, or the other platform. Today's event is also divided into two parts, as a lot of our events, uh, events often are. The first event or part of the event uh, will be a public sort of presentation and discussion on art and class struggle. And then at the end of this live streaming, we'll head over to Zoom uh, for a discussion that will not then be broadcast live. Uh, so you can join us uh, at the end of the, the public portion of the event. We will be placing a, a link to Zoom in the chats uh, so that you can see the link and find us um, and, and be part of the discussion. We really hope that you'll join us for the, the, the discussion at the end of today's um, event. Um, so those are the, the main things about how uh, today's event is going to go. Uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about the IMT, uh, both local events being hosted by 
the comrades here in Madison or around the country or around the world, um, you can definitely check out our articles, news and analysis on uh, Marxist.com as well as socialistrevolution.org. You can also sign up for our emailing list at imtmadison.org. That's our local website. Um, and we'll send you, uh, not spam, but a lot of great information about events coming up and ways that you can um, get involved. You can also uh, donate. Uh, as you know, the revolution will not be funded by the Facebooks or the Warren Buffetts or the Ford Foundations. Um, the IMT is only funded by its membership, the hardworking uh, people and friends uh, who, who are working to build the forces of Marxism both here and around the world. Um, and you can do that by donating, for example, via Venmo at I-V-Y-G-E-E-R-T-S. Um, and you should see that as a banner sort of floating across at the bottom of your screen as well. Uh, so lots and lots of ways to, to get in touch with us, stay in touch with us. Um, you know, reach out, discuss if you're if you're interested in con, uh, continuing the conversation. Uh, all of that said, um, before I introduce our speaker for today, I wanted to uh, sort of give a little bit of an introduction to you know why are we doing art and class struggle? A lot of people might think like, well, you know, why are you guys wasting your time on art? You know, aren't shouldn't you be talking about more pressing issues like the COVID vaccine? Um, and how many people are dying or the most recent election in the United States or attempted coup that happened in DC um, and, and what's going on, the rise of the far right. Like, why are we wasting our time, you know, talking about art? That's something that, that we'll sometimes hear from people um, about, about, such, about this topic. Um, and I think, you know, at, at its very foundation, you know, art is important to people, um, you know, and that's been true from even the earliest sort of human, human societies. And I think that fact alone is what makes it worthy of, of study, especially for Marxists. You know, as Marxists, what are we doing? We are striving, you know, for nothing less than the complete liberation of, of humanity. And that is a, a premise that actually requires um, a great deal of creativity and imagination. And what is art um, if it is not uh, imagination? And so I think I'd like to um, turn it over here pretty soon. Comrade Simone is, is going to give us our, our introduction to uh, this discussion. Comrade Simone is a member of the Madison branch as well of the IMT. She has her MFA, her Master's in Fine Arts from the University of Wisconsin here in Madison. Um, and she currently works in the education department of the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, not only is she a dedicated comrade, but she is an artist in her own right um, and very passionate about this topic. And we are so lucky uh, to have her uh, giving an introduction to this uh, really important topic today. So that said, um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Simone. Okay, thanks Yvonne. Uh, hello and welcome to everyone tuning in. Um, and again, thanks Yvonne for getting us started for hosting this event. Um, I prepared a short introduction to tonight's topic on art and the class struggle. Um, and of course I can't possibly touch on everything uh, as both these subjects are very broad, um, but I hope that uh, at the very least it, it clarifies some of the key conclusions that Marxists draw about art's role in society and in the fight for a better world. Um, as Yvonne said, our branch is hosting a discussion on Zoom afterwards. Um, we'd love to talk with you about these ideas. Um, so please look for that link um, following my intro um, if you want to join us for that. Um, as Marxists, we understand that art is fundamental to human flourishing, um, that it always has been from its inception. This much is clear if you just try to picture a world without it. But under capitalism, a system driven and sustained by the exploitation of workers for profit, the vast majority of people are denied the opportunity to fully experience the arts, much less to spend their time, energy, and resources contributing to them. The right to express ourselves and to fulfill our human potential is crushed under the weight of the capitalist system, which stamps out the individual and collective talents and abilities of the majority in the name of profits for the few. And so long as society's functioning remains chained to this profit motive, art will never truly be free. So in fighting for socialism, we're fighting for a world in which the full creative and productive potential of humanity can be realized, where everyone is free to develop themselves, to enjoy and to participate in culture. 
And based on a materialist understanding of history, we argue that this kind of world is only possible through the revolutionary transformation of society in which private property and wage labor are abolished and society's productive forces are placed in the hands of the workers themselves, elected democratically to represent the majority of society's needs. So with all that said, um, I wanted to focus this intro a bit on the nature of art in class society and specifically under capitalism and a touch on the material basis of art and artistic development. Um, so in a text called The German Ideology, which was co-written by Marx and Engels, uh, the pair describe how in class society, the dominant ideas of every epoch are the ideas of the ruling class. They wrote, quote, the class which is the ruling material force of society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. Under capitalism, which is a form of class society, a small handful of bankers and capitalists control the means of material production and in turn have a universal monopoly over the culture that's produced. Um, so now I'm gonna ask you, Alex, uh, who's our producer, to pull up my screen so I can share an image with you that I think helps describe this concept. Um, so hopefully you can all see this uh, well enough. I know the, the smallest white text is a little bit hard to read, um, so I'll try to explain it. Um, so this is a diagram that explains uh, the relationship between what's sometimes referred to as the base and the superstructure. Um, so what I mentioned uh, before, this material conception of history, the materialist view of history, um, explains that um, you know, humans have to first take care of their immediate needs, food, water, shelter, and clothing, um, before we can begin to pursue things like art or philosophy, science or religion. Um, and those pursuits, those latter pursuits are often said to set humans apart from other animals, um, but they were only developed once we began to produce tools, which freed us from our otherwise dependence, complete dependence on the forces of nature. Um, so in the end, the development of culture in any given society depends primarily on the level of its productive forces. That is how society reproduces itself by making and distributing all the things people need to survive and more. Uh, so humanity and human consciousness evolve with every change in the material base. Um, so the base itself consists of what we call the means of production. Um, so it's the tools, the machinery, the factories, land, and raw materials used to generate society's goods. Um, this economic base also includes labor power, you know, the social relationships and the class structure formed by the mode of production and the private appropriation of socially produced wealth. So that the kind of entirety of um, the economic system, how things are produced. And from this material base arises an ideological order, um, what we call like the superstructure of human activities, um, all of our endeavors. So um, this includes our legal and political institutions, um, you know, the state, law, politics, um, and all of this uh, is largely shaped by the economic forces and are used by the class and power to maintain and legitimize those underlying relations. And while people's ideas, views, and conceptions change with every change in the material conditions of life, this relationship between the economic base and the ideological superstructure is not simple and direct, uh, but rather it's dialectical, it's contradictory. Um, a style of art, for example, may arise out of the prevailing material conditions, but it also enters into a complex web of relations where it interacts and is shaped by other ideological expressions, um, is filtered through human consciousness, and at times can even shape the particular expression of the base itself. Um, but in the main, uh, the most important point here is that the, the economic base is the dominant force um, in society. Uh, so thanks, Alex, you can uh, close that screen. Um, so again, that image I think just helps to illustrate this concept that in class society, the dominant ideas of every period are the ideas of the ruling class. Um, again, that material force uh, kind of begetting the intellectual force. Um, the capitalists control not only our education systems, the press, media, and advertising, but also venues and sites of explicit artistic production and, and expression such as museums and galleries, record companies and recording studios, bookstores and publishers, theaters, concert halls, and the realms of radio, TV, and film. For the ruling class, art and culture are big business like any other branch of production. They're used to maintain or increase profits as saleable commodities for speculative investment by a privileged minority of collectors, art dealers, gallerists, and wealthy patrons based on market trends. Art is also explicitly used to feed the working majority a steady diet of cheap and popular entertainment as a way of keeping us content with our lives, however alienating and miserable. This commercial art is on the one hand vapid and unoriginal, 
and on the other, elitist and obscure, where the work of art is like an inside joke that's only meant to be understood by a few people, um, by those with the requisite education to grasp whatever meaning is apparently behind it. Rather than empower artists to freely experiment, to play and to develop new ideas, the ruling class by design invests billions in churning out this kind of shallow and estranged art, which um, really just reflects the overall decadence and decay of the capitalist system itself, which is in decline. Um, so I'll ask Alex here to share my screen again so I can show you a few images that I think encapsulate this phenomenon well. Um, so on screen here is an image that went viral over the holidays. It's from a few years ago, um, and there have been variations of the same image, but um, what it boils down to is that it's a collection of, of Hallmark's Christmas-themed movies um, represented by their covers, and all of them kind of comically contain the same formulaic ingredients, um, you know, namely this, this white hetero couple smiling and posing for the camera um, in red and green. So again, this like total lack of originality um, that's being turned out. Um, and then here you have this work of art by Italian artist Maurizio Catalan, um, editions of which are sold for $120,000 each. Um, you may have seen this uh, crop up in late, late 2019. Um, it's literally a banana duct tape to a wall. Uh, but if you talk to the people who purchased it, they would tell you about how the work serves to inspire debate on the absurdity of capitalistic art production and how we assign value to objects. Um, and while that may be the case that those conversations are had, uh, what I think this work and the spectacle around it highlights is the utter degeneration and distortion of art under capitalism and how it becomes a kind of contemporary equivalent to the Roman era bread and circus diet used to placate and distract the masses from wider concerns of reality to keep the majority content with the status quo. And a wall-mounted banana or a shark in formaldehyde or whatever else is trending um, on the art market is, is is just that, is unlikely to raise uh, you know, consciousness among, among people, among workers, uh, let, alone, let alone rouse us into action. Um, so all of this is to say that art falls under the influences and constraints of the environment in which it's produced. Um, so all artists um, are under this influence. Uh, the expression art is not made in a vacuum, I think reflects this understanding well, an understanding of this phenomenon, that the artist is no more free from the ideologies and pressures of society than anyone else no matter how personal or intimately psychological their work might be. Um, and under capitalism, this environment is dominated by the ideas and motives of a ruling class who holds the levers of material and social production. In spite of this cultural stranglehold um, under what we might call the dictatorship of capital, there are countless artists from the opposing class, the working majority who, sensing that life isn't what it ought to be, consciously enter into conflict with the status quo through their art. Uh, Alex, if you want to bring up that screen again. Um, so for example, you have artists who use their work to raise awareness and to inspire action around issues affecting their communities. Um, I think of you know, all the mur murals and the other forms of street art and public art that have emerged out of the Black Lives Matter movement, particularly in the wake of the George Floyd protests. Um, on screen here is a work by Lincoln Rust and Anthony Catarucha, hope I'm saying his name right. Um, and this is on the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And this was, uh, again, following the, the George Floyd demonstrations um, and the commission murals downtown. Um, many of these artists uh, seek and sought to use their work as a tool for communication, to spread a message, to move and shake people out of old habits or ways of thinking, to cry out against the violence and racism of the state, to demand alternatives to our present reality. Um, and I think a lot of this work embodies um, a really revolutionary spirit um, and then you have countless artists who just genuinely seek to bring beauty, color, and meaning to a world that for so many would otherwise be unbearable. The fact that the vast majority of people live and work in the most alienating conditions and yet are still able to find solace in music, dance, literature, or film, whether deemed fine or not, um, points to just how fundamental art is to human life, how deeply connected it is with our very being. And this is where we as Marxists locate the real future and potential for art and the creativity and striving of the working class, the working majority for a better world, a world that is truly human. Uh, thanks, Alex, you can take that down. Um, and from its origins, art was not an expression of class, but of humanity itself. For our ancestors, there was no division between art and life. The earliest forms of art, song, and dance were based in ritual and magic, 
These were activities with an express social function, which was to better understand and gain control over the natural world. For example, we now know that the early cave paintings depicting bison, deer, and wild horses were created by hunter-gatherer societies not as mere decoration, um, but as part of a ritual practice aimed at improving the collective's ability to hunt those animals for food. These practices involved uh, the whole community and were explicitly linked with productive activity with the striving for life itself. It was the overthrow of what we would call primitive communism, you know, sh the shared commune, and the emergence of class society based on the base, uh, sorry, on the basis of surplus, that art became the endeavor, property, and enjoyment of a privileged minority. The first forms of class society were based on slavery, which divided people into masters and slaves, into free citizens and manual laborers. Those privileged enough to be members of this new leisure class were unburdened by the hardships of physical labor, and as a result, were free to study, to think deeply about the world around them, to look at the stars, for example, to philosophize, to invent and create, while the rest of society were condemned to a less than human existence of labor and total exclusion from the very culture and quality of life that their work made possible. This antagonism of exploiter and exploited, of soul crushing, alienating work by the majority for the benefit and enjoyment of the few, epitomizes all human relations and activity under capitalism, our present form of class society. And yet we're told that the system is synonymous with freedom, that capitalism provides the basis of democracy and individual freedoms. Defenders of capitalism will point to free trade, free choice, and the free market, using this incredibly myopic and distorted concept of freedom to justify imperialist exploits around the world, while the global majority remains chained to the real motive, which is to maintain or increase profits. And while it's true that capitalism initially increased the productive capacity of society, and that today more people than ever before are able to access the technology and tools needed to create art, all of this creative potential is squandered by capitalist exploitation and greed, and access to these kinds of resources and materials is still in no way universally enjoyed, and I think that is, is clear. Um, Marxists see capitalism for what it is, an oppressive, profit-based system that's completely incompatible with freedom, with artistic expression, with human flourishing and progress. We are fighting to overthrow this economic system and emancipate the human race from the drudgery of labor and exploitation. And that's what socialist revolution is. It's the fundamental transformation of society on a material level, where the working majority unites to take control over the productive forces and begins to retool them on the basis of need, not profit. In our view, the prior condition for human flourishing and true artistic freedom is the struggle for socialism on a world scale. By fighting for the end of capitalism, we seek to give ordinary workers more time to enjoy and participate in culture and to lift art to new levels. And it's our firm belief that artists can play an important role in this class struggle. Art can be weaponized for the struggle. It can represent the needs and aspirations of our class as a whole. It can lift the veil of appearances and show the world as it really is, or envision the possibilities of what could be. This kind of art connects with the masses. It adopts a passionate position on the issues at hand, and it speaks out forcefully against the status quo. Trotsky was particularly interested in this question and wrote a number of texts on art, literature, and revolution, including a manifesto written in 1938 in collaboration with Andre Breton and Diego Rivera. In it, they described the preconditions for genuine artistic freedom and called on artists to join the cause for worldwide socialism amidst the backdrop of rising fascism and Stalinist totalitarianism. In other writings, Trotsky touches on the enormous loss and waste of human potential under capitalism which represses the ingenuity and creativity of ordinary people. In a text from 1932, he asks, how many Aristotles are herding swine? Which poses the question, how many more brilliant thinkers, artists, inventors would be around today if their potential hadn't been crushed by the capitalist system? Years before, on the eve of the October Revolution in 1917, Trotsky attempted to establish points of contact between artists and the revolutionary movement. To persuade artists and writers in order to truly be free, art must be revolutionary and must fight for the emancipation of humanity. And if you agree with the sentiment and you want to learn more, or if you're simply interested in talking with us about these ideas, we hope that you'll join us now on Zoom for the discussion. And um, Alex, if you can bring up my screen one last time, I'll just quickly share a slide of the image credits. Uh, meanwhile, I think the, the link for Zoom will be posted and Yvonne, I will hand it back to you.
All right. Thank you, Simone, so much for giving us uh, wetting our appetite for the discussion that is about to follow. Um, friends, if you're watching us today, comrades, um, the link to the Zoom discussion should be showing up any moment now if it hasn't already um, in your in your chat uh, in your chat bars. Um, uh, I want to take this chance not only to thank um, Simone for, like I said, wetting our, uh, our appetites for the upcoming discussion. I also want to thank our producer who's been behind the scenes, uh, Comrade Alex, for making the technological side of everything run so smoothly. Um, and of course, all of you for uh, showing up and, and, and participating um, uh, with us today. Um, I also want to let you know that if you really enjoyed uh, today's uh, discussion, uh, you have plenty more opportunities to do so in the future. Um, the next event that we're going to be hosting as the Madison branch of the IMT will be on Thursday, February 11th. Um, it'll be on the COVID-19 vaccine and the need for socialized health care. So definitely check us out. There's going to be plenty of opportunities this spring for you to continue to engage with us on um, really important topics. Um, also, if you want to stay in touch with us, you can find us uh, by signing up on our website um, for our email list. Our website is imtmadison.org. Also, check out our Facebook page, um, which is IMT Madison. That's another place where um, you can engage with us, send us messages, um, you know, find out what events we have of coming up. Um, also, we highly encourage you to subscribe to our newspaper. Um, and you can do that again by contacting us on our website, sending us a message through Facebook, up, or signing up on, on any of our websites. Uh, for the latest news and analysis, um, you can visit our websites at socialistrevolution.org. That's the US section of the IMT. And you can also um, find more excellent um, eh, news and analysis. I'm repeating myself on marxist.com. Uh, That's our international website. We are an international organization and internationalism is one of the cornerstones of Marxism. And we wouldn't do be doing our due diligence as an international if we didn't talk about what's going on around the world. And right now, um, there is an important campaign taking place in El Salvador um, that we need your help with. Um, the, our comrades in El Salvador have been, uh, since about July of 20, uh, 2020, been supporting workers um, in uh, Florenzi Industries um, who uh, were dismissed because, of, because their factory decided the cl to close the doors amidst the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, workers are owed up to half a half a million dollars in in back wages um, and are demanding the expropriation and nationalization of that factory several of the workers have also um, been participating in a hunger strike um, you can read more about that um, and about those about their struggle on our on our website um, we highly encourage you to send them messages of support um, uh, using um, the the hashtag um, uh, uh, that you'll that you'll find um, and sending them messages to uh, their email address as well um, letting them know get your local union your local student club your local organization to send a message a message of support um, uh, again the the struggle of the of the workers and comrades at Florenzi industries in El Salvador really needs your help um, and so, we highly encourage um, you to learn more about their struggle and and to pass resolutions um, in your local organizations, whatever else that you do, um, sharing on social media, if you can, uh, information about their struggle. Again, um, that that important cornerstone of Marxism is, is internationalism. Um, and we wouldn't be doing our due diligence if we weren't talking about um, those struggles taking place all around the world. Um, so again, big thanks to everybody um, who participated today. We, we hope that you stay in touch with us, that you reach out with us. Um, uh, you can also, like I said, um, donate uh, to the local organization here in Madison, uh, to the IMT to support the work that we're doing. 
Uh, you can do that via Venmo as well as uh, by finding other ways to contact us on, on Facebook and on our website. So again, uh, without further ado, we're going to sign off here and hope uh, that you join us in the Zoom discussion. Thanks.